on today's episode. And I had this record, a live record actually, and before somebody would take a break on that record, Doc would say, pick it, son. And Uncle Johnny said, Kevin, if you're ever having trouble dancing, just cinch him in. All kinds of tales from all kinds of tellers here on The Appleseed. It's time for The Appleseed. In each episode of the show, we bring you a couple of stories from favorite storytellers. And these stories will entertain you and inspire you. They'll get you thinking and maybe even help your family tell your own stories. I'm Sam Payne, your host, and our first teller today is from the great Minnesota storyteller, Kevin Kling. Now, if you've ever looked on the way in which you're different from other people as a superpower, well, this is a story for you. If you've ever lost something important, well, this is a story for you. If you've ever fallen in love, boy, is this ever a story for you. You know, a Kevin Kling performance is something of a roller coaster ride. A bunch of vignettes strung together, anecdotes filled with poetry and comedy and pathos. But in the end, we bet you'll hear something you want to hang on to, something you'll want to share. Here's Kevin Kling with a performance he calls Love Story, recorded live in the Appleseed Studio. I wanted to tell a love story because one of my buddies always would say every story, and this is the best advice for storytelling, if you treat every story like a love story, then it'll work. And it's true. Every story in my mind is a love story of some kind or another. And uh, and so I think, and oh, and I have a buddy that works with guys. He's a psychiatrist that worked with guys coming back from Iraq and then Afghanistan. And this guy told me the sentence that has saved more lives than any other is, you will find love again. And I think that to be really true, that when we know there's love again, there's something to live for, something to go for. And when I was a kid, I remember the first time I fell in love. Oh, man. Robin Johnston. Okay, Johnston, she sat in front of me because I'm Kling, so JK. So Robin Johnston sat in front of me, and I had the biggest crush on her. For one thing, uh, she was Catholic, so forbidden territory. And, uh, <laughs> and But I didn't care. I was so, so in love with her. And one day, she turned to me around, turned around and said, come away with me and ride to the land of tumulus tide where love's first blush has never flown and faith is ever grown. And I will give you a hundred hounds and a hundred robes of murmuring silk and honey and wine and oil and milk and a hundred shields and a hundred bows and fleece as white as sea foam flows. And a hundred youths, merry as birds, will dance with the speed of salmon herds and obey your every whim and then... She sighed, but it grows late, and love and music and sleep await. Or maybe she has to borrow a pencil. (laughs) It doesn't matter. No. I mean, that's exactly what I heard. Because when you're in love, oh, when you're in love, she would walk into the room. I would actually Try to make seconds last longer than they last. One more second, one more second, Robin, one more second. The cracked cup of love, after all, is in constant need of filling. And when she tells me I look good, I believe it. When a man is in love and he looks in a mirror, he will see exactly what he's being told. And she, oh, I would fall, oh, I I would think we were like star-crossed Italian lovers, and I, like Dante, would march into the underworld for her, and she, like Sophia Loren, throwing a basin of water out the balcony, shouting, but mama, I love him. (laughs) But unfortunately, Robin moved away, and although we promised to write and stay in touch, our love seemed to pass, and I missed her, I missed her so much. But you know what I've learned about love? It never goes. It never leaves. Places of someone you love, when they're gone, at first they make you miss them to the point of pain. But over time, it's those places that bring them back to you. And I have places like that for my dad. I have places like that for Robin when I would go. Then all of a sudden, she comes back to me through that place. Oh, here's a better example. 
Um, I'm, I'm at my brother's wedding and my grandmother was there and she wanted to dance. And I can tell by her face she wants to dance. Okay, I'm a terrible dancer, worst dancer. And, and I'm thinking, oh, no, Grandma. I, and, but I could tell. So I said, okay, Grandma, do you want to dance? And she goes, oh, of course. So Grandma gets up, and I'm doing a terrible job. I'm stepping on her toes. And I, man. And then I remember something my Uncle Johnny taught me. Uncle Johnny's the best dancer in our family. And Uncle Johnny said, Kevin, if you're ever having trouble dancing, just cinch him in. So I cinched Grandma in. And... <laughs> We started to, and I'm dancing for the first time in my life with my grandmother. And I'm thinking, I'm going to catch her eye like, hey, grandma, we're really cutting a rug. But I looked down, and her eyes were closed, and she was smiling. I don't know who she was dancing with, but it sure wasn't me. (laughs) Uh, Okay. Here's what I think the key to the whole thing is. Love and all these things. Listening. Listening, listening, listening. When I was teaching kids one time, uh, I, I was saying, what makes you different gives you power. What makes us the same gives us resiliency. But if you want to know your power, it comes from our differences. It comes, and, and I said, here, I can prove it. So what we did was we would make superhero characters out of what makes us different, out of what sets us apart. And I'd go around and say, okay, what makes you different and what is the superhero character? I get to this little girl and I say, What makes you different? And she goes, I'm really, really shy. And I said, I know you haven't said anything for two weeks, but why does that give you power? She says, because sometimes people forget I'm in the room and I'm invisible and I know everything. (laughs) And she did. She knew everything. This little girl, I could ask her about any kid in that class. She could tell. I could ask her about teachers. She knew about every teacher. And in fact, sometimes I'd be talking to a teacher. Ah, there she was. Oh, where, where, where'd you come from? <laughs> so I thought, I gotta, I'm going to start being like that. little. I'm going to start listening to that point of empathy. That point of empathy where you listen with your entire self. Your entire being listens to somebody. And that is the one of the best feelings in the world. Empathy is getting the wisdom of another through their experience. And you cannot overrate it. So uh, uh, this this invisible girl. And oh, uh, uh, this brings me to my last story. It's about, um, I was in a motorcycle accident. Because I haven't described my right arm yet, have I? I haven't got into my right arm. My right arm, I was in a motorcycle accident 20 years ago. And uh, so I tell kids, if you see my arm move, tell me after the show, I'll get really excited because <laughs> it hasn't moved in 20 years. And I was in this motorcycle accident and I had that experience. People, you, you might've heard about this where people see a light and they're headed for this light. Okay. I didn't have an exact experience. I was headed for this sense of peace and I was given the choice to follow that peace or to return to this plane of existence where even at that moment, it was clear there would be consequences. And I returned. And you know what? That's always bothered me. Why did I, re- why didn't I follow that sense of peace? And then I remembered I was in Australia in 1987. It's so beautiful, so peaceful. I wanted to spend the rest of my life there, but my visa was running out. So I knew I'd have to come back to the United States. But that's when this woman named Ray said she would marry me so I could stay there. I just met her that day. She said, I don't care, I'll marry you. So (laughs) I was going to marry Ray. But right before our wedding, right before my visa ran out, I I can't go through with it, Ray. I've got to get back to the United States. I've got to get back to the belly of this beast where I can do something about the world I live in. And that's when I realized I need tension in my life. I actually need tension. I mean... I wear socks with sandals because I know it takes some people off. (laughs) So I came back and uh, and that's when I I was in the hospital and people were sending prayers and well wishes. It's hard to deny the power of prayer when you're on the receiving end. At times it was like being behind a powerboat when I just had to hang on. Oh, I was also on morphine. Morphine is this amazing evil. I mean, it takes care of the pain, but all the world becomes the morphine world. I, you cannot convince me half the stay in that hospital was not on an Italian mountaintop or there weren't two guys in the room spying on me dressed like televisions. <laughs> and my wife brought in pictures so the plastic surgeons could put my face back the way it was, but there was concern from my buddies because in one of the pictures I was holding the dog. <laughs> 
friends brought in books on tape. I found Harry Potter got me to sleep at night. And when I couldn't go to the bathroom, Tom Brokaw's greatest na- generation got the nation moving again. Uh, when I would get down or depressed, I look at our wiener dogs. We have wiener dogs. And you will never see a more can-do attitude and a more can-do body than a wiener dog. <laughs> So my life completely changed. And one of the things that, that changed was I, I wondered if I could perform again. Would I ever be able to go on stage again? And, and, and so I joined this theater company called Interact Theater. Thing about Interact, it's all guys, all people with disabilities. So the first day that I'm there, we go around the room and they said, if you could take a pill to take away your disability, would you take that pill? Out of everyone in the whole circle, I was the only one that said, of course, of, yes, of course I would take that pill. I mean, I couldn't understand why all these guys, all these people, these actors would not take that pill. I mean, I couldn't imagine preferring the body I have now than the one I used to have. And every day I learned something from this company. Every day. There's a, a group of singers, four singers uh, 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 that have Down syndrome, and they call their group the Downbeats. And... <laughs> They are hilarious. They're this amazing group of singers. Their lead singer is Laura Mullen. And Laura, we, we were opening a show one night. Everything wrong happened. People were forgetting lines. Props were breaking. A fire broke out backstage. We got it out pretty fast. But uh, <laughs> the, the sprinkler system came on, sending people running out into the February night. It's freezing cold. And everyone's running out there. And uh, ambulances and fire trucks. is pandemonium. Laura turns to me with a little smile on her face. And she goes... I can't work like this. (laughs) There's this woman named Ingrid, and Ingrid has aphasia. I don't know if you know about aphasia. It's, It's where thoughts don't make it to words. And so her thoughts are jammed in her head, coming out, and and sometimes it sounds like poetry. Well, Ingrid was a third-year law student when her fever struck, and now she has aphasia. And she turned to me one day and she said, I used to feel, I think, therefore I am, but now I know we come from a deeper place. Now I know I am, therefore I think. When she said that, I thought of Rumi's beautiful love poem, before right doing, before wrong doing, there is a field and I will meet you there. And why Shakespeare puts the lover, the lunatic, and the poet in imagination all one, it's because they all go behind the mirror. They all go behind what we see as reality. Like Dante. Dante went to the underworld, right? Dante goes to the underworld, which he called Dis, D-I-S, which is Latin for the underworld, the place of shadow and reflection, the place they round off the rough edges of torment and desire. Dante knew You cannot cure a loss, whether it's a limb, a heart, a promise. The heart especially is an instrument once broken will never play the same. But although it can't be cured, it can be healed. And Dante knew that this was a necessary step to paradise. And it's also the prefix for words like disability, which doesn't mean unability. It means able through another way, able through the world of shadow and reflection, a foot in two worlds, dis. So I'm with this theater company. I'm in Australia. And we perform. There's 5,000 people on the side of a hill. And we get done, and the audience is applauding. Then these two opera stars take the stage, Teddy Rhodes and Simon O'Neill, just these heroes to this place. And they sing and with the, they sing these arias and uh, the solos, and it's just beautiful. The idea was, when they were done with their solos, we were to join them for the grand finale. But the Sydney Symphony, who was playing along with them, the symphony said, we haven't had that piece of music long enough. Would it be okay if we finished on one of your solos? And Teddy Rhodes said yes, he would take the final solo. It ends, the concert ends. 5,000 people on the side of this hill are on their feet. They're just applauding him. He's a hero to them. He stops, gets everyone seated, reaches behind his back and pulls out a sheet of music. And he says, we were supposed to end on another number, but the symphony didn't have the music long enough, and I understand that. But on the way to this stage, I passed another stage, and there's a piano, an upright piano. If we can get back to that piano, I think I can play this. 5,000 people didn't bat an eye. They grabbed their picnic baskets, their blankets, and we all went to that tiny stage, and they crowded around 5,000 people around this tiny stage, and he played that piano. And our choir, with the voices of angels, took that group before right, before wrong, to that place where I am, therefore I think. 
That was the first time, the first of many times, there is no way I would have taken that pill to take away my disability. And that's how I feel to this day. There are some days, of course, I would take the pill. Of course, I would rather have my arm back. But I would never trade the person I'd become to the person I used to be. I, I gained much more than I lost on that deal. So, yeah, I wouldn't take the pill. And right now, I sure wouldn't. And that's going to take me to my final, this poem um, that I've won. This poem... Okay, our planet didn't have the minerals and the, uh, the, 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 to create life. We needed planets and asteroids and comets to crash into this planet to give us things like iron. Iron comes from outer space. So if that's true, everybody in here is a piece of a star. And if that's true, this is a constellation, unique and two tonight. This is it. This is our constellation. And so these are some things I've learned in time among constellations. I've learned there are people I share my blood, but there's also people I would give my blood. There, that knowledge is acquired, but wisdom is recognized. I've learned that love thrives in audacity. <laughs> it dies in carelessness and hides in simple gestures. I've learned there's the trip you plan and then the trip you take. And home has gone from a place that is to one I remember to one I now create, where I know the names of God, what's funny, what's edible, what's sacred, and now where I will find you. So I'm looking up to the stars. And I know now, though not burning any longer, some still send their light. So I'm looking to the past and the future. I'm looking to home. And somewhere between where I stand and they send their light, we meet me looking to the heavens and the stars looking down at what it's like to be alive. Thank you. Kevin Kling with a performance he calls Love Story. Recorded live in the Appleseed studio before our terrific studio audience. You know, that story went so many different places, tales of love and loss and growth and healing. By the end of that performance, Kevin was communicating something really important, that the person he's become is due to the difficulties he's faced and that he wouldn't trade those difficulties away if he could. In fact, what he's learned about love and empathy and friendship, how he's learned to be a part of a constellation of people is more valuable to him than an easier life might have been. And Kevin's insight makes me want to share what I know, what I've come to love and believe about empathy and friendship and the important things of my life with the people that I love too. Stories have this wonderful way of sprouting and growing just like seeds as the stories bring up thoughts that grow into conversations. Maybe that's why we call the show The Apple Seed. We're going to bring you a story in just a moment from Josh Goforth, a little performance from the great Appalachian storyteller and musician. You're not going to want to miss a word or a note. I'm Sam Payne. <laughs> such a pleasure for me to be with you on today's episode of The Appleseed. I'm going to follow up that story from Kevin Kling with a piece from the North Carolina storyteller and musician Josh Goforth, who brings beautiful Appalachian music and stories together. And this performance is about meeting your heroes and about how proud and happy you can be when a dream comes true. If you've ever practiced and practiced and practiced to become better at something than you love. Well, this is a story for you. And if you've ever had an opportunity to tell someone who inspired you how much that meant to you, well, this may be a story for you too. Here's Josh Goforth with his story about legendary guitarist Doc Watson and a performance of the Streamline Cannonball to boot recorded live in the Appleseed studio. <laughs> Thank you. 
Well, let me play you a song by one of my guitar heroes, the great Doc Watson. Doc was a blind guitarist from Deep Gap, North Carolina, and Doc didn't get discovered until he was in his 40s. Actually, he was living in this cabin that had no electricity, and he was playing electric guitar with no electricity, believe it or not. And there was a fella who came uh, down to start recording some mountain folks playing, a guy named Ralph Rensler, and he discovered Doc, and kind of the rest is history. And so for us mountain kids growing up who were musicians, Doc was one of our idols because he had created this style of guitar playing that he called flat picking. And that's where he had taken the old fiddle tunes and he was able to play every single note on the guitar. And before that point, you know, you might have had like a Mother Maybell Carter style where we would have bass notes and then some, some notes around it, you know, like that, but never fast picking like... Except for Doc. And when I heard that sound, I just had to play like Doc. And I had this record, a live record actually, and before somebody would take a break on that record, Doc would say, pick it, son. <laughs> and when I was a kid, I wanted to hear those words so bad that I would sit on the edge of my bed and I'd play rhythm guitar. And before I'd take my break, I'd go, pick it, son. And then I'd take my break. <laughs> well. I always wanted to meet Doc, and through my association with David Holt, a great uh, storyteller and musician from Western North Carolina, uh, who I got the fortune to play with for 20 years, he was actually playing the last several years with Doc, of Doc's life, and in 2002, I got to get on stage with Doc, and I got to hear the words, pick it, son, so I can die a happy man. <laughs> and. Doc said something really interesting one time. He said that the train was one of the most influential sounds in the mountains because it was probably the first mechanical sound that mountain people had ever heard. That And if you hear Doc Watson's guitar playing, you'll hear. It's like a train. It's just propelling you forward and you feel like you're riding along with Doc Watson. So I want to play you one of those songs that I got to play that day for the very first time with Mr. Doc Watson. And it's a song about a train called the Streamline Cannonball. Here's the way it goes. It's a long steel rail and a short cross tie I'm on my way back home I'm riding on the king of them all It's the streamlined cannonball She moves along like a cannonball Like a star in its heavenly flight Oh, the lonesome sound of the whistle you love As she travels on through the night The headlight it beams out in the night And the firebox flash you can see I'll ride the blind, it's the life that I love Well it's home sweet home to me She moves along like a cannonball Like a star in its heavenly flight The lonesome sound of the whistle you love As she travels on through the night Here it comes I can see the smile on the engineer's face Although he's worn and gray A contented heart, he waits for the call On the streamlined cannonball She moves along like a cannonball Like a star in its heavenly flight The lonesome sound of the 
whistle you love as she travels on through the night. I said the lonesome sound of the whistle you love as she travels on through the night. Josh Goforth, recorded live in the Appleseed Studio with a performance of the Streamline Cannonball and a story about learning who you are by digging down deep into the place you're from, sinking roots there, about gathering up the traditions and values of your people to become the best version of yourself. You know, I was reminded, listening to Josh play and talk, about my Uncle Mike playing Walking on the Moon by the police in my grandpa's living room. It was just about the coolest thing I'd ever seen when I was a kid. I thought maybe I could grow up to be like my Uncle Mike. And, you know, I still kind of feel that way. It gave me something to aspire to, to become part of this tradition of musicians and performers in my own family. If the story that you heard from Josh reminded you of somebody, you might want to reach out and tell them, or at least tell their tale. Thanks for joining us today on The Apple Seed, and thanks to Kevin Kling and Josh Goforth for sharing their stories and music with us. Listening to these stories always brings up memories for me that I love to share. Where did the stories take you, and who will you take along? Today's episode of The Appleseed was produced by Heather Bigley and Brian Tanner, edited by Carly Wilson, Trent Horton, Natalia Reeve, Hannah Harlan, and Evie Hendricks make up the rest of The Appleseed team. If you want to send us a note, you can email us at theappleseed at byu.edu. We love to hear from you. Or if you're listening through a podcast app, rate us. Leave us a little review. It helps people find the show. We're pleased and proud to be among the many shows in the BYU radio family of programs. And you can find this episode or any episode from our archive on the BYU Radio app at byuradio.org slash Appleseed or by Googling the Appleseed podcast. I'm Sam Payne, and I can't wait to be with you again on the Appleseed. Appleseed.